Cool. Um, so yeah, this is, this is what we're here to talk about. We're going to be talking about why we use somebody else's code. And so if that's what you want to hear about, you're in the right room. And if not, you're trapped in here for the next 40 minutes and you cannot leave. Oh, they just left, so that just proved I'm wrong. Thanks, guys. <laughs> um, all right. But anyway, uh, I want to introduce myself. So hi, I'm Michelle. Um, and I, I design stuff, usually stuff for WordPress. And although they put me in the developer track and asked me to talk about developer tools, uh, I'm really just a front end person with a background in design. So I don't know how much credibility that's going to give me up here on this stage, especially compared to all the other people that are going to be speaking in this room. Uh, but bear with me. Because one thing that I do do is I spend a lot of time at WordCamps and other open source events. Uh, and I'm constantly in discussions with a lot of other really smart people about new tools, about resources, about the things that they're doing in order to do development. And if you have spent any time uh, where more than one developer is in the same place, how many of you have? Besides today, I mean, obviously, we're all here in the same room. But if you've gone to a meetup, if you've hung out with people at your work, if you're a developer, um, if you've ever read any article or blog post about the state of development, if, uh, if you've ever done any of that kind of stuff, it's inevitable that we are going to have a conversation about our tools. Um, but how many times have you done this where the conversation starts to go something like this? Don't use code base. It sucks. It's too heavy. It's too slow. It's too bloated. It's unsemantic. It's not exciting. It's not x or y or z enough. right? No one writes code base in year anymore. <laughs> it's not modern. They came up with something better. This framework is the new hotness. That one's the old, boring framework. Or I don't bother with code base because I just rolled my own. It's superlative. Why would you use that bloated, old, sluggish, terrible tool when you could use a better, faster, leaner, more targeted, more performant one that you wrote yourself? Why the cuss are you using code base? It's so shocking to me that I can't even have a discussion about it, and I'm just going to shut the entire conversation down right now. You're not a real developer if you use code base. Real developers don't use frameworks. They don't use GUIs. They don't use certain CMSs. They don't use certain languages. They don't use certain techniques. You're not a real developer. So when you heard a statement that sounded like that, or read that article, or participated in the discussion, how did you react? Were you one of the people that was nodding along and agreeing? Or were you on the other side of the argument and feeling like you had to defend your choice? And why did you have that opinion? Why were you agreeing, or why were you feeling defensive? Where is the line that you draw between the good tools that are OK to use and the bad tools that you shouldn't be using? Has that line changed for you over the years? And why has that line changed? Um, this is just some simple Googling of phrases for things that I use in all of my client projects, right? Um, so one is don't use WordPress. We've got about 79 million results for that. And one is um, don't use jQuery, about 11 million results. Don't use PHP, 176 million results. Um, I use these in pretty much everything that I build for my clients every day. But I bet you've seen, I bet you've all seen stuff like this before, right? All of this. So do you remember at the beginning of the talk when I kind of apologized for just being a front end person speaking in the developer track? Um, why did I feel inclined to make that joke? How did you react to that joke? What did you think when I said that? I've given this talk at some non-WordPress events, um, like other developer events. And I make the same joke, but I actually make the joke about how I'm a WordPress developer. Like, I don't know if that gives me more credibility on this stage, guys, but you know. Um, why is that? And how do all of these things contribute to the learning environment, contribute to the inclusivity of tech? Especially, we're, we're supposed to be open source. We're supposed to be welcoming people. How do these things, how does this environment impact people that want to ask questions or want to learn something new or are just getting into the environment today. And now there's always a rebuttal. Like, there are certain facts that do exist, right? Like, we do have to talk about security. We do have to talk about speed. We have to talk about the philosophy. We have to talk about best practices. Like, there are absolutes. Not everything can be good, right? And, and that's true. 
we do need to discuss those things because there are actual repercussions to the code that we use, right? I mean, we are putting things out there in the wild and we should be doing things well. So what do we do? How do we talk about all of these very real and important factors without shutting down conversations and without dealing in absolutes? So first I want to get rid of a whole bunch of inaccurate assumptions that we might have about the way people code and about the way people choose the tools that they use. Uh, the first inaccurate assumption is we don't need tools, we don't need to use somebody else's code, we write our own, like we roll everything ourselves. All right, well first of all, of course we need tools, like you're at a WordPress conference, right? So I'm guessing we all use WordPress, which is a tool that somebody else or many other people built, right? So we, we all use somebody else's tools. Um, unless you invented your own programming language and wrote in that, you are using somebody else's tools. And even if you did, you probably learned how to do that from what, looking at other people's languages, right? So there's, no, there's no, nothing unique here. Um, everybody here is building on top of somebody else's toolkit right now. That's what brought you here in the first place. Another inaccurate assumption is that when we talk about code, we are only talking about code. Like the only thing that we're discussing is what we're writing. Not the case. Obviously, there is an outside context. We're not just talking about the code. We're talking about what pe brought people to that code and what, what decisions people were making when they did that. We also assume that there are universally right and wrong answers um, that are the same in all situations. And obviously, of course, clearly, you have come up with the right answer. Uh, and everyone else is an idiot until you learn more and change your mind. And then that's just the right-er answer than it was before. Like, you were right before, but now you're more right. And maybe you were an idiot before, but it's fine because now you're better. Clearly, that's not actually the case. Another inaccurate assumption is that the only limiting factor that people have is a lack of skill. And also that every single other person can, wants to, or needs to gain that skill. And so the answer is simply to teach people to use better tools, AKA the ones that you think are the right ones, which are obviously better because you think they're right. Another inaccurate assumption is that everyone's on the same journey, which means that Everybody else has taken similar paths to gain their skills. Everybody has a similar balance of skills. Everybody has the same resources to access their skills. And everybody has a similar baseline and a similar life to be able to build their skills upon. And so that means we can definitely project our own experiences onto everyone else. Again, very inaccurate assumption. But the most inaccurate assumption is that the choosing of tools is simple. A person looks at two code bases. One is wrong and one is right. And so they pick the right one. That is an inaccurately simple way of how it works. So how, how does this really work? And this is the part where we're going to get really nerdy, so be very excited, because I have infographics, and it's going to get fun. <laughs> Hope you're excited. Um, there are many parallels between how we choose coding tools and how we play games. So who in here is a gamer of any, any sort? Board games, video games, whatever. Cool. Um, so I'm not a gamer at all. I, I don't play board games. I don't play card games. I don't play video games. But but I'm, I'm tangential to a lot of gamers, so I spend a lot of time watching games of all sorts. Um, whether that's like board games, strategy games, uh, video games, RPGs, like open world games, first person shooter games, collaborative games, party games, like I've, I've been there for all of the games and I've been able to observe it and I've seen a lot of patterns as to how games are played. So you can boil pretty much any game down to this collection of statistics. So first of all, we have the game itself, um, we have the player or players who are playing the game, and we have the tools, which are basically the things available to you inside the game that enable you to play the game. And I'm going to break all of these down into even more details. So let's talk about the game first. So first of all, um, the game is basically the, the internal rules and external situation you are playing, everything about, everything about this game. Um, in developer terms, that would be equivalent to the situation in which you need to use the code and all of the internal and external factors that apply. So there's a lot of different things that go into a game. Here's some like nerdy looking stuff. So uh, games have an ecosystem. Uh, this ecosystem has different factors like time, complexity, resources, and importance. I'm going to break all of those down. And games also have different kinds of objectives. So you might have a resource management style game where you're trying to kind of build an empire. You might have a competitive game versus a collaborative game, which are very, very different. Are, are you playing against the other players? Are you playing with the other players? Um, are you trying to accumulate things? Are you trying to get rid of things? There's lots of different objectives to games. 
but we're going to talk a little bit more about the different components of the ecosystem. So the first statistic I want to talk about is time, which is obviously how long you have to complete the game. Um, inside a game, uh, turns might be timed. So I mean, there could be like in chess where there's a certain amount of time, or levels might be timed where you have to beat the clock in order to complete something. Um, there's also a few different ways you can play a game using time. So if you've ever played a game on a speed run, that means you're trying to complete the game as fast as possible, which is a very different way of playing the game than trying to play a game through to completion where you do literally every single task that you can possibly do. Two very, very different approaches to time inside a game. As a developer, what does that look like? Well, these are factors like internal uh, or client timelines that they've, they've imposed on you or that your team has imposed on you. Uh, it could be the number of contract hours that you have available or that your subcontractors have available. It could be whether you're trying to be very, very efficient versus very, very thorough. It could be uh, something where you're using like an agile methodology and you have sprints or you have phases or any other kind of methodology. These are all the things that impact the time that goes into a project. Then we've also got complexity, and complexity is basically how intricate or involved the gameplay is. And games obviously have very, very different levels of complexity, and certain things can be very simple in some areas and complex in other areas. Um, so obviously, of course, the number of rules and processes. Do we have like a massive, thick book or a single page that explains how this works? Um, how many phases or levels are there? Is this like a linear game where you basically only progress one way, or is this a nonlinear game? Is this an open world game where you're basically free to go everywhere and do everything within whatever your skill set is? Or is it a closed world? You basically can only do the one thing that you're supposed to do. Um, single versus multiplayer, that's definitely a layer of complexity right there. Are you doing everything or do you have teammates that you have to worry about? Um, single versus multi-objective, is there only one thing you can do or are you trying to do a whole bunch of things at once? I'm always thinking of like Skyrim, which is just like you're constantly running like 20 different errands for all these other people and you're running around killing dragons and you're building a house for some reason. And yeah, like there's just like a million different things that go into complexity. As a developer, what does that look like? Well, obviously it's the complexity of functionality of the thing you're building. Right? So are you building maybe for a website like a simple brochureware site, or are you building something that has to integrate with a whole bunch of other third-party APIs? Um, are you having to worry about managing multiple languages like PHP and JavaScript? Or even the content, is the content in multiple languages? You know, um, What kind of compliance do you have to worry about? What kind of standards do you have to meet? These all go into the complexity of a project. And now we've also got resources and resources. So inside a game, it's basically like the supply of money materials or other assets necessary to complete the gameplay. What do you need in order to keep playing this game? Um, one is obviously time available. Uh, one is like an outside game budget. So for example, real dollars, how much real dollars do you have to spend to play this game? Uh, it could be something like having to purchase um, stuff to like be able to play the game more, like in-game weapons, or it could be you're playing a card game and you have to actually buy cards in order to build your deck. Um, there's also inside game budgets, right? Like a lot, of, a lot of these bigger games, like your character earns money and your character uses character money to be able to buy more armor and stuff. Uh, so there's multiple resources here. Um, developers, obviously, there is a budget too, right? For a project, there's usually a budget. Um, there's also how much manpower or developer hours do you have available per week or per day or per month or whatever. Uh, how much does it cost to get licenses for things? How much does it cost to be able to host things? There's lots of uh, budgets and resources that go into a project. And finally, we've got importance, which is basically how critical is it to complete a game or a specific level within the game to a specific degree of success? So obviously, in the game world, if you are in a, a real competition, like there's stakes and there's prizes and, and you're competing, it's a little bit more important than if you're just like playing in your friend's basement for fun. Um, there's also stuff like p player reputation. You know, How important is it to be able to maintain a certain level of standards? Um, does completing this level in a certain way build, like, create a building block of like how well you'll be able to do on further levels? That's kind of how it works in a game. Um, as a developer, basically how, how mission critical is 
the success of your project. I mean, what security concerns do you have? Is there e-commerce that can't fail? Is there, are there uptime requirements? Um, is there like some kind of symbolic importance within the company? Like this is really meaningful to the boss or whatever. This is really meaningful to somebody who needs to get a promotion and look good in front of their boss. There's a lot of different things that give a degree of importance to the game. So that's basically the entire ecosystem of just, just the game, just the context. But now we're going to talk about the player, right? So in the game, obviously, this is the person who is playing the game. Uh, in development, this is the developer or user of the tools, right? Um, so player stat, players have stats. And these stats of the player impact which games they can play, uh, how far they can get, and which tools are available to them. And players have a few different things. So players have skill, which is the ability to use tools. Um, they have knowledge, which is different than skill, because knowledge is awareness or familiarity with the game. And then they have a philosophy, which is how and why they play. So I'll break down all of these. First of all, skill. This is probably the first one we think about. Um, the ability to use or wield tools. So in a game that's you know, your, your level, your experience, what, what teams you're on, what guilds you're a part of. Um, often skills need to be acquired in a specific order. You, you kind of have to progress through a certain number of things. You can't just jump to a high level. Um, and if you're in a very complex game, again, I'm thinking of something like Skyrim or something like that, um, you might have different skill levels for different types of tools. Like you might be super great at archery and super terrible at sneak, which is kind of awful if you're trying to shoot somebody and they can see you. Um, but you have different skill levels for different, for different types of, of tools. Um, as a developer, these, there's lots of different things you can have skill levels in. Uh, the languages you know, uh, the type of dev work you do, you know, you're a front end person, are you a back end person, are you a sysadmin person, do you have a traditional computer science background? Um, you often have to learn them in a certain order, right? You can't really jump all the way to the advanced stuff without doing some beginning stuff. But players also have knowledge, and this is actually different than skill. Um, and this is really more about being familiar with the game as a whole. So how well do you know the ecosystem? Uh, have you played a similar game before? You know, like maybe I haven't played this open world game before, but I have played open world games before, so I understand the concept. Um, how well do you know this game in general? Like, how well do you know the map? How well do you know which guy you have to go find to ask this question? How well do you know the types of quests you're going to be going on? How well do you know where you can find resources? This is, this is knowledge, it's not skill. Um, as a developer, obviously, these are related to a lot of the tools you're going to be using. So do you know the specific framework you're going to be working on very well? Do you know the language you're writing in? Uh, how well are you familiar with the community and who is doing what and where you can go to ask questions? Uh, how well do you know the CMS? Uh, are you object-oriented? Are you functional? Like, do you write in SAS or less? Like, there's so many different things that you could have knowledge about. And then there's also the philosophy, and this is how and why we play the game. And your philosophy has a big degree of influence on the attractiveness and utility of the tools that are available to you. Um, the same player can play the same game totally differently with different philosophies. Um, so for example, if you're a game player, do you prefer to play the game um, very straightforward and following the main story? Or do you prefer to play games as fast as possible and competing for speed? Or do you prefer to play games where you do every single one of the side quests? Uh, those are very, very different ways of playing the game. And that influences the tools that you choose and the decisions that you make. As a dev, how do you write your code? Why do you write your code? Do you want to write it to be uh, readable? Are you trying to make it maintainable by other people? Are you trying to write code to be secure? Do you want it to be accessible? Do you want it to be very performant? Do you want it to be bleeding edge? Um, these are all kind of very different philosophies that might lead you to make very different choices in how you write your code. How many comments do you write? Do you minify everything? What do you include in things? How well do you document things? Like what, do you, what things are you choosing to write with? Very, very different philosophies. And then finally, we have our tools. And the tools are the actual specific things that you are using to execute. So in a game, that would be the specific weapon, the specific resources, maybe a specific character, a specific set of moves, a specific set of armor that's available to you. These are all your tools. Um, and each tool has a set of requirements and a value and a risk associated with them. Um, the requirements kind of limit which players uh, and games can use them. But value and risk are kind of relative, and each person picks those kind of 
based on their own philosophy. So as a developer, um, again, these tools are what languages, what frameworks, what snippets, what plugins, what modules, what themes. Um, generally, we will be using more than one tool over the course of a game or over the course of a project. Uh, and we might change the tools as the game changes. So we might start out by using these simpler tools and end up using more complex tools. Um, each of the attributes that a tool has, uh, the player will assign either a value or a risk, um, which is, again, relative to how the player is playing the game. So let's talk a little bit about value. So I've got some little like icons. So let's say this, this particular tool right here, uh, on the plus side, the value, uh, it is secure, it is well supported, and it is well documented. So these are kind of positive points in favor of using a tool. And if these positive points align with what you as a player deem to be valuable, and this is, how, this is like how you play the game, then this is a tool that's going to be ranked positively in value to you. Um, some of these values can be mitigated by risks that are higher than the value. So for example, um, for example, this tool is the same tool, uh, but it's, it, it might be secure and, and supported and well-documented, but it's also time-consuming and complex. Um, so these are negative points. Uh, whether or not you decide to use this tool uh, can be influenced by which of those you think is kind of more important, right? Uh, so if I'm trying to do something really, really fast and without having a lot of time to learn it, I may not pick a time-consuming and complex tool, even if it's secure and well-supported and well-documented, right? Because it just doesn't fit with my philosophy for this game. But if I have lots of time or if I'm trying to learn something new or if I don't mind that it's complex because I need it to be complex, I may decide that this tool is positive and I really want to use it. So the player philosophy and what game you're playing will determine whether these risks outweigh the benefits. Each tool also has a set, set of requirements, so it's basically the skill and knowledge level required to be able to use the tool, also which game you are playing. I'm obviously not going to use armor to play solitaire. I mean, I could. That would be kind of fun. But um, so these are like basically your prerequisites for player skill level knowledge and gameplay. Uh, so for example, this particular tool needs somebody with a skill level of five and a knowledge level of eight. These are just arbitrary random numbers I made up. Um, so if you don't meet those, you can't use this tool regardless of whether or not it meets your philosophy, right? That's just how games work. So now we're gonna start taking these things and combining them together to show how different a game is based on different stats. So first of all, let's take a player and modify their stats and see what happens to their gameplay. So we've got a player, uh, this is a player called the Noob. Um, they have a low skill, low knowledge, so they're just starting out, they don't have a whole lot. Um, what does that mean? That means that there are very few tools available to them. So there's a set of tools underneath each tool. Um, if, they are, if it's bright, that means that they know about it. Um, and so they have knowledge about it, and the number represents the skill level that they need to have to wield it. So what does that mean? That means that um, basically they have very, very few tools available to them that they can use. So um, they pretty much can't complete every game. There's very few games that they can complete at this skill level. Um, but they may not want to increase the skill level to play themselves. They may rather just partner with somebody who has a higher skill level than them to complete this game. But they can't do it themselves. So that's low skill, low knowledge. We've all heard of the noob, but this is one we may not have talked about as much. This is uh, the enthusiast. So they have low skill, but they have high knowledge. I actually see a lot of these people at WordCamps when we're talking about uh, WordPress-related stuff because they may not be developers, uh, they may not know how to you know, use all of the tools, but they are aware of a whole lot of tools because they are constantly in the ecosystem, right? So they're coming to things, they know a lot about a lot of plugins, they know a lot about a lot of things, they can have a really good discussion about, about WordPress, but they aren't a developer, so they are not wielding all of the tools. So what does that mean? You can see um, they're pretty much aware of the existence of like all of these tools except for like one. But there's only a couple that they could actually wield themselves. So um, they, these people often desire to learn, they want to increase their skills, or they want to partner with a player with skills to do something interesting. But these are, these are really interesting players um, that we don't often talk about, because we usually assume that people are either noobs or experts. This is, this is another kind of player level. It's actually a really awesome player level, I think. Um, this is another one we don't talk about, too. This is the artisan, where they have a high skill but low knowledge. What the heck is that? How do you have that? Well, picture this. 
a uh, PHP developer, a traditional PHP developer, trying to build something in WordPress. So WordPress is built in PHP, right? But um, so they are great at PHP, right? They could PHP circles around me, probably. But um, they don't know WordPress. So they don't know like the WordPress way of doing things. They, they're constantly reinventing the wheel and, and doing stuff that WordPress already has something for. So this is an example. Um, they could wield almost every single one of these tools, but they don't know about them. They know about like one tool. And so they are kind of in a similar situation to the noob where they're, they're struggling with it. Um, they also, they're also like get easily frustrated, right? Because they know that they know PHP, but like they don't know how to, how to write for like WordPress. And so they get very, very frustrated and feel like they're being restricted and that these rules are very challenging. Um, so I feel like the artisan is a very, very interesting player as well um, because they, they get easily frustrated. They're very, very smart. And all they really need is more awareness of the ecosystem, but they already know how to use most of the tools. And then, of course, we have the expert, which is the, the high skill, high knowledge person. Many of the people that are you know, speaking and attending this event are this. They are aware of most of the tools, and they know how to use most of the tools. Um, they definitely have a desire and ability to keep learning. And they're also the ones most likely to argue about tools. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, so that just shows you just how changing the player impacts what tools they can pick. right? But now, let's modify the gameplay. So let's talk about different kinds of games. This is fun. So we've got the, the churn and burn game, which is a, a low time, low budget game, everybody's favorite game, um, which definitely influences the value and risk ratio of tools. So here we've got a selection of tools. Um, we've got the tools that we can use and the tools that we've decided are a good idea to use. Um, even high skill players, even players that are high skill, high knowledge, expert players may choose to wield simpler tools due to the ease or cost of use. So this could be somebody who could definitely roll their own anything, but they're working on a churn and burn game. They are going to probably pick something that is mostly pre-built in order to get it out the door in time, right? Or get it out the door in budget, because it makes sense in the context of this game. Um, so yeah, so if you're a developer, if you need to do something quickly or cheaply, you'd probably be more inclined to reach for an existing framework, especially if you have lower skills in that specific area. So like if you're a, a back-end dev, you may end up using a front-end framework like Bootstrap or something similar to that to put the UI together because you want to try to get something out the door and front-end is not your specialty. Um, here's another game. It's mission critical. So this is a high complexity, high importance game. Um, Low-level players like can't join this game. Like they do not have the skill set to join this game, right? Because this is an extremely complex, extremely high skill level required game, um, and only uh, the only tools that will work in this game require high skill and high knowledge and low risk. So this is a very, very different game because only only very specific players can play it, and only very specific tools can be used. So this is something like. Um, it needs, it's like, this is where you have to be very choosy about your code, so it needs to be very highly vetted, it needs to be very secure, or maybe it needs to be, maybe it has to be bespoke, like you have to be able to speak to every single thing in it and explain why it's there. So maybe we can't include other libraries, we can't use pre-rolled plugins, we have to do everything ourselves because we are extremely responsible for this. So that's this kind of game, this is the mission critical game. There is also the unbeatable game, right? The high complexity, low budget game. Um, Certain combinations of game stats, you just can't play this game. You cannot win um, because you either have no qualified players or no usable tools. So if you've got the, the I need you know, the next Amazon for $500, I'm sorry, that is an unbeatable game. <laughs> that is high complexity and low budget. We cannot do this. It, it just it doesn't work. No tools are available to us that will beat this game. So then we've got the tools themselves. So basically, how do we pick these tools? How do we weigh things against each other? And again, we're talking about values, risks, and the requirements. Um, so the risks and values, like I said, of any given tool will influence how they're chosen, even if the tools require a similar skill level to use. 
So even though these are both level 8 tools, um, the one on the left uh, we're assigning a, a positive value to because it's got all these great things. Or on the right, it has a bunch of great things, right? Like it's, it's affordable, it's well maintained, it's easy, um, but super negative, it's not secure. So we don't want to use that tool because the negatives outweigh the positives. Even though they are both level 8 tools, we can wield both of them, but we have definitely decided that that one is not a good idea and that one is. We could also, uh, the, the tool selection is also influenced by our own player skill and philosophy, right? So player A, this is the same tool. It's, uh, it's a secure and well, and well supported and well documented tool that is time consuming and complex. Player A says, good, this is a positive. I want something that are these things. I don't mind that it's time consuming and complex. Player B says, I don't have time for the thing that is time consuming and complex. This is a negative. We're talking about the same exact tool, two different players, two different decisions because they have different philosophies and they are playing different games. So value and risk are very relative to the game that you're playing. So a tool one player sees as an asset, another player might see as a liability. Same exact tool. So what does all of this mean now that I've like thrown a bunch of infographics at you? Um, what does this actually mean about discussing tools? Well, first of all, what it means is it is not simple. It is not as simple as looking at tool A versus tool B and saying that one is right and the other one is wrong. It means that it's very, very complicated, right? There's so much going on here. This is really more what it's like when we're talking about what tools we use. Um, the choices we make and the tools that we use are impacted by our own skill, knowledge, and philosophy, by the restrictions and parameters of the project we're working on, and how we weigh the values and risks of each tool. So there are a ton of factors that go into every decision that we make. So obviously decisions are multidimensional, right? That's what we're walking away with. Every decision is multidimensional. It is not simple. And there are other reasons that people make different choices than you aside from just lack of knowledge. So they are not just making a different choice than you because they don't know something. We also need to remember that not everyone wants to gain skill. Not everybody wants to learn how to wield every tool. Um, even when we want to spread knowledge and awareness through stuff like this or through talking to people, helping people out, it doesn't mean that everyone wants to learn how to wield the tools. We don't all have to learn to code or become proficient at every single tool, language, or framework. So what can we do? First of all, stop this. All right, stop it, stop it. This isn't helping anyone, it's inflammatory, and it completely turns people off that want to join the community and do something new. If all we're doing is bickering about the tools that we're using, stop it. I'm serious, don't do that. Remember that we can help increase knowledge without demanding that people also increase skill. Um, that means we can help our clients make empowered decisions without expecting our clients to want to become developers. I don't want my clients to be developers, but I can help them make education, educated choices about WordPress. Um, we can help other developers make empowered decisions, even if they don't necessarily want to use the same tools that we're using. We can have a good discussion about it and let people make good choices. Uh, it doesn't mean, again, it doesn't mean that everybody has to learn to wield all the tools. We should also learn when to concede. Um, so one thing I have learned from watching a lot of games is that good games include the ability to be able to concede without having to like go through the entire, like if you know you're going to lose, you don't have to just sit there and like wait for yourself to lose like many, many turns later. Like a good game will let you concede when you know that you're going to lose. We can learn when to walk away from something or when to ask for help. This is, this is part of playing a good game. Um, we can partner with people who have complementary skill sets. Like if we don't want to learn to wield a tool, we can find somebody who knows how, and then we can have a team, or we can have, you know, um, so this is great. And it means that we can keep learning, we can have division of labor, you know, we can have a party and go on quests together, and, and it'll be great because we, we need lots of different skill sets to be able to make projects good. And we can have empathetic decision, discussions about our tools. So we can learn more about why we make decisions, and that will help us educate people when necessary and communicate effectively. So that is all for the formal part of the presentation. Uh, this is me. This is where I am on the internet. This is the link to the slides if you want to stare at my nerdy infographics some more. Um, but otherwise, I have some time for Q&A. So feel free to ask me some stuff.
Awesome. And it doesn't have to be questions about um, exactly what I said. Like, you know, I'm usually really expensive, so this is like free Q&A time with me. <laughs> <laughs> right? So do you have a team of your own? And uh, what, what tools do you work with? Sure. So the question for the at-home players, because I'm being videoed, um, was basically, do I have a team and what tools do I work with? So I'm independent, um, although I do not only my own work with clients, but I also collaborate with other agencies. So maybe I partner as a designer with development agencies that don't have in-house design. I've also partnered as a developer with design agencies that don't have in-house development. So that's kind of fun being on both sides of that spectrum. The tools that I use right now, obviously WordPress uh, is what I'm building most of my sites in, although I've done some front-end only stuff where I used Oh my gosh, Brad Frost's thing that he did for Atomic Design that is a, oh my gosh, I can't remember the name. Um, well, anyway, he built, a, he built a tool that let you build Atomic Design front end delivery stuff, and it was really cool, and I'm going to remember it at 2 in the morning what it is. But um, I mean, I right now am, have kind of rolled uh, my own starter theme that was roughly based on some of the stuff that um, Roots was doing. Uh, it's, I've kind of like diverged from it. I've branched off from roots. Um, sorry, I like puns. Um, <laughs> I have a theme that I, I work on. I've written kind of a flexible content framework based off of advanced custom fields where I've basically rolled a whole bunch of common, con so I've, I've like built myself, such, it's all on GitHub. So um, Mark Time Media, I'm Mark Time Media basically everywhere on the internet, so if you want to find my GitHub, it's there. Um, I've got a bunch of the tools that I use on there. Um, I don't know. There's like a lot of things I could be doing better or different. Like I use Sublime Text to code, right? Um, I don't know. I use I use local uh, for my local development. Which, if any of you went to that session this morning, I didn't, but uh, it's good. Like <laughs> local, the one by the flywheel. Yeah. I mean, but everybody like. A lot of people I know use a lot of other things, but for me, like working independently, I don't need anything super complex to support. So I don't know. Um, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. yeah. What do you do when you uh, encounter someone with the um, beginning of the presentation with those type of views? How, how would you convince them uh, of your perspective? Sure. So the question was basically. When I encounter somebody who's kind of speaking the way that was alluded to at the beginning of the presentation, what do I do? Um, I mean, obviously, it depends on whether I feel comfortable engaging with that person. But assuming that it's a person that I'm comfortable engaging with, um, usually I find that the most powerful way to combat anything like that is to ask somebody why they think that way, like find out where that's coming from, and then be able to have a reasonable discussion about those things. So if somebody says, oh my god, don't use WordPress, I can be like, oh, well, why is that, right? And we can, then we can actually have a conversation about you know, speed or security or whatever. And actually, some of the things that they you know, talk about are valid. Like, I mean, you don't necessarily need WordPress if you just need a one-page static site. Like, there's no reason to load an entire content management system for that. Um, if you need something to be very, very bespoke, like maybe you don't need to use WordPress or something like that. So there's like valid reasons behind it. And I just help them see the difference between like those reasons and like a broad statement that applies to all things, right? But I, I live in the world of nuance. So um, that's like where I spend most of my time. And not everybody's going to listen, but it's usually a more friendly conversation at that point. Yes? What's PHP? PHP is a recursive initialism. <laughs> By the way, who in here knows the difference between an initialism and an acronym? I learned that this in the last year. Yes? No? Um, an acronym is a word that actually sounds like a word, like scuba, whereas PHP is an initialism because you say the letters. So every, I, lear, I was brutally corrected on this one like about a year and a half ago, and so now I'm spreading the joy so you don't have to have the pain that I felt. Um, PHP is a... 
Oh, I'm bad at explaining things. It's a, well, it's a, it's a development language. It's the one that WordPress was written in. It's a, it's a backend language, right? So it's rendered not in your browser. It's rendered in the server. And I'm doing a real bad job of explaining it. Is that an OK, like, colloquial definition? OK, I'm like looking at you. <laughs> OK, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to keep going. This, that, was, that was enough. That was enough. Thanks. But it stands for PHP Hypertext Protocol. <gasps> that makes me s processor. Sorry. <laughs> PHP Hypertext Processor. Prepress. It, it has the word PHP in it, and that just it just makes me just think of just like infinite PHPs going. I don't know. It gets me so worked up. I don't even know what it means. <laughs> yes. No. That's great. That's fine. Thank you. All right. Yes, I know, but then they decided to be jerks and be recursive, and <sighs> I have thoughts on that. <laughs> I love recursive. You don't like recursive acronyms? They're not acronyms, but I know. <laughs> See? <laughs> now we're, we're having a thing. <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, if you take anything away from this talk, take away the difference between an acronym and an initialism. Forget all of this. <laughs> okay. Yes? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so the question was basically when dealing with noob or yeah, you yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, like the yeah the um, the noob or the enthusiast versus the the artisan. Yeah, I I think that I mean anybody who's kind of set in their ways is kind of hard to convince. Whereas somebody who's ready and excited to learn, um, they're I mean they're both going to have their difficulties and challenges, right? Um, I personally think it is easier to kind of find somebody, if you have the time for it, it's easier to find somebody you can mold and like shape into a thing that works in your workflow versus trying to like take somebody else and like shove them into a peg that doesn't quite fit, um, which is the whole debate that also happens on like the whole rock star on a team thing and whether or not that's good or actually detrimental. Um, another interesting thing that's come up with tooling is obviously I have tools that I use when I'm doing my own thing, but when I'm collaborating with teams, I will try to use their tools if they have a process and they can explain it to me. Like, oh yeah, we use this for local dev and this for compiling things and this and this. Like, I most, I use, you know, CodeKit to do most of my compiling because I don't, I'm pretty much just compiling SAS and maybe minifying some JavaScript. Like, I don't need to, but, you know, I know other people that, you know, use command line based stuff and it's like, all right, well, if that's what you use, then I will use that for your project because then we all have the same tooling and files and we can exchange stuff. Um, so I'm willing to learn and, and do new stuff when it makes sense, as long as they can tell me why, you know, like if they can be like, this is why we use these set of tools, then sweet, let's do it. Um, but yeah, it's definitely easier to work with people that want to learn than people that don't want to learn in general. But I don't know. You, you could have the experienced person who wants to learn as well. Sure. Well, that's why I'm saying in general, like, yes, people that, people that want to learn are great to work with, and people that don't are not. <laughs> so be the person that wants to learn, which I can tell you are, because you're all here. Hooray. Thank you. Um, Sure. Fine. Yep. But even even like with clients who definitely don't want to be a developer, um, they always appreciate learning more about being a good content manager. And so like me being able to teach them how to get to things inside the admin and like how to do the stuff with their their content that they want to do and how to not have to call me to change a picture, like that makes them feel really awesome too. So that's even a type of wanting to learn, and that's good. So. Um, all right, well, I guess we that'll be about it. So I'm going to be around the rest of the day. I'll be at the after party. Uh, feel free to say hi and go get some more coffee. <laughs> <laughs>